Can no. make it for your uh, the the Dragon's Den type thing. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks right. again for your time. Um, so transitioning on to the second talk of the day, we have a tag team next. So we're really fortunate to have Dr. Madhu Chetan, who's an SE4 IR trainee and also a previous academic clinical fellow and academic foundation doctor, so plenty of research experience. And we have Dr. Tom Gibson, who is a, a experienced ST6 IR trainee in Southampton, again, has undertaken several projects during his um, diagnostic and interventional radiology training. So uh, over to you both, share about your research opportunities in um, radiology training. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, so I'm going to start us off um, talking about research opportunities in IR, and um, Tom's going to take over after me. And we're going to try and go through both um, the academic training in radiology and some advice on how to start off if you're thinking of applying for a post like that. And then um, some of the differences between um, research opportunities within the academic route versus the um, more traditional clinical training route and how you can make the both of, both of them. Um, so um, in general, there are two entry points for ACF into radiology training, either at SC1 or at SC3. And in either case, the ACF programme is three years long and it gives you 25% protected academic time over three years. Um, it's really important to note that your FRCR exams and clinical competencies and milestones are all the same regardless, and the ACF doesn't add any extra time to your training. Um, if you are thinking of applying for an ACF post, it's um, important to start thinking early about it. The jobs come up in different deaneries in each year, and it can be really difficult to predict where it's going to be in the next year. Um, this is a picture I've taken from the IR Juniors website um, of the 2021 ACF posts across the country. Uh, often these jobs are in competition with other specialties. So when I applied, it was a job that was shared between radiology and hematology with both specialties candidates applying for the same post. Um, what I would say is if you already have a strong research interest, look at the centres that are active in this area and then you need to ask yourself, what does the balance look like for you of geographic location on the one hand, the research area, and then being an academic for sure. And, you know, balancing all of those three will help you make the right decision about whether a post like this is for you. If you do like the sound of the deanery and the type of research that they do, um, it's really worth contacting a potential supervisor early on. Um, hopefully that means you'll have a chance to meet them, to get shown around the department um, and to get put in touch with one of the current ACS. And it's always really helpful to hear kind of from the horse's mouth exactly what the experience has been like. Um, in terms of getting research opportunities, I think the way it works within an ACS post and within usual clinical training um, is a little bit different. So in an ACF post, because you have that protected academic time, it, I think, lends itself a bit better to a longer term project. So, for example, one that you start from scratch with protocol and ethics or um, taking part in uh, helping out with a clinical trial. And I think you do really need the dedicated research time to do that. It might be tricky in your own time. Um, also, um, ACFs come with funding for a research skills qualification. Um, in, in my deanery, it was a postgrad diploma in health research. And again, I think the protected time is really essential to attend the course because it, it's in-person in learning. Um, as an ACF, you end up in a research active unit um, with at least one senior academic in the unit and this means that you automatically get more um, research opportunities because there's always something going on and you'll also have um, near peers who are registrars a few years above you who will also be active in research which is quite a nice environment I think to be in. Um, you're given a formal supervisor who'll start you off with a research project and you're also given a mentor outside of radiology as well as a network of other academics who can act as a support system. Um, there is access to small grants for projects and for um, conferences and travel, etc. Um, the kind of NIHR ideal pathway is to move straight into a PhD after your ACS, but this is not something that's commonly done in, in radiology, from my experience, especially with people who've had SC1 to SC3 ACS, and that's because of the timing of the um, FRCR exams. And I think you do have to be wary that you can't really do anything, including research and radiology, without the exam. So they always end up taking kind of top priority. 
Um, my experience of uh, kind of getting research opportunities in the ACF has been in two halves. So um, I think in SC1, when I started, I had a very kind of scattergun approach to projects, probably because of a combination of not knowing which subspecialty I was headed towards, and then also not yet having the radiology skills to make me a useful addition to ongoing projects. For example, I couldn't control lung nodules um, as an SD1. Um, but then in the second half of my ACF, I've ended up prioritizing and working on projects uh, that have been with people that I really wanted to work with, and also with people who are equally invested in the project success as I am. Um, I've had the experience of getting a study off the ground with writing a protocol and getting ethics, and that has been a long road, um, and it's only now that we're opening the study after my ACF time is over, but um, it's been great to have the, the dedicated time to be able to do that. I think um, from my experience, probably the best way of picking research projects in, within an ACF programme is to get a really good balance between quick projects that are quick wins and that give you output and something to show on your CV for the time you've had versus long-term projects, um, which are a bit longer in the pipeline, but perhaps a bit more interesting and satisfying and more aligned to what you're actually interested in. Um, so I think getting that balance right is really important. Um, the usual clinical training group in radiology, I think also gives you lots of different opportunities to um, get involved in research, but in a slightly different way than the ACS. Um, I think one of the biggest benefits is that because radiology is such a steep learning curve and completely unlike anything you've done before, it is really nice to have five days a week to gain all of your clinical competencies, especially in IR, because you can't really substitute your own reading or anything for time spent in angio. Um, and the benefit of that is that you have had time to progress through your training to develop your subspecialty interests, and you can seek out a project that really fits in with that. Um, you also have a lot more flexibility in finding a supervisor. It's not kind of a formal person who's given to you. Um, and it's worth remembering that this person that you, you kind of go and seek out to the projects doesn't have to be in radiology necessarily. I've had colleagues um, here in Oxford who have done wonderful research and PhDs with um, supervisors in engineering, so completely outside of medicine and, and also supervisors in oncology, for example. So do kind of look and think outside the box when you're looking for a supervisor. Um, because there's no dedicated research time to account for in, in your usual clinical training, there's really no pressure to kind of produce a certain amount of output. And um, everything that you do is a bonus, um, which is great. It's really helpful in terms of giving you time to find the right project for you. I think my biggest bit of advice with um, kind of getting research done without having dedicated research time is to try and keep a project ticking over regularly. And I know that that's something that's a bit easier said than done, but it is so much better to try and spend half an hour on it most evenings rather than trying to find a whole day to dedicate to it. And this way you can turn things around really quickly and get you know whatever you've done back on your supervisor's desk ASAP for their input. It shows you're proactive, it shows you're persistent enough to get it done. Um, and I think that's really important when you don't have dedicated time um, to, to try and keep things ticking regularly. Um, one potential um, problem, if, if you are on the usual clinical training route, is that you might be working in a centre that's not particularly research active. And I think this is changing and re research is becoming more and more um, a normal thing in multiple radiology centres. But if that does apply to you, there, there are avenues if you're interested in research. One is obviously thinking of supervisors outside of radiology. Imaging is so pertinent to so many different projects. And then another would be to think about national collaborative projects. Um, so the BSIR has recently launched the Unite Collaborative for IR research, and there's going to be lots of talks on this later on today. And this is a great route to get involved wherever you are in the country. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tom now, who will take you through the ins and outs of choosing a research project. And then I think we'll go through questions at the end if there is time. Cool. Thanks very much, Mali. That was great. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Tom Gibson. Uh, I'm one of the SD6 registrars uh, here in um, Wessex. And I'm going to uh, take you through. I can get it up here. Can everyone see this? Is that sharing well? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. 
So yeah, I've been asked to give a, a lecture here on uh, choosing a project. And the first thing to say is that I'm not speaking from a position of righteousness here. This is from a series of trials and errors. And it's good for someone in my position at the end of their training, once they've done a lot of uh, projects, to be able to give this kind of talk and impart some learning that could save everyone else a lot of time. Sorry, Tom, I think you've got the, um, not the presenter mode on. Ah, thank you. Is that better? Yeah, brilliant, cool. thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so main objectives, looking at the need to be proactive as, uh, as Dr. Little uh, and also Madhu were uh, emphasizing there. Um, looking at what I think are two key practices that are quite quick to do and can help you to make sure your projects uh, or the ones that you invest your time in are effective. Uh, looking at whether you should go it alone or work in a team um, and identifying some predictable pitfalls that will come up and that uh, you can hopefully get around with good planning. So on being proactive, when I was the uh, local research rep in radiology uh, here in Wessex, um, I would every now and then get some emails from people who are wanting to do projects, um, looking to up their CV to get into radiology. Um, and they would send me quite non-specific emails, essentially asking me to find them or hook them up with a project. Um, and the sort of implicit uh, return is that they give an undefined amount of their time and effort, uh, which already seems a bit risky on their part. Uh, and added to that, um, the assumption is that anything that I suggest is going to be useful to them. Uh, but clearly, not all my ideas might be useful and not all projects uh, are successful. Um, so you need to be very careful and you need to arm yourself with your own ideas. And I think this is what a lot of people uh, struggle is to actually generate their own ideas. So I just wanted to go into uh, looking at what can help you with that. And I think if you unite, unite three main areas, um, then you'll be on the right path. So looking at your interests, looking at the hand you've been dealt in terms of where you work and looking at your own personal vision as well. So interests, what uh, interests you in the most basic sense professionally? Is it medical education side of things? Is it more theoretical things? Um, is it uh, putting out academic papers? Um, these kind of things. What, what do you want to be looking to do with your projects? Um, are there any organ systems that you are interested in, subspecialties? Um, and you can even pivot on your areas of disinterest and think, well, actually, I, I don't think I like uh, GI radiology, but I haven't really investigated much. Maybe I could use a project there to give me a bit more insight. Um, so I think that can be very helpful to think like that as well, not necessarily discard everything. Um, do try and challenge yourself as well. In your workplace, look at the extremes. What are the, part, what are the things that your department does that are quite specific to it, um, that are quite advanced, that other centers might not do yet? Um, and they would uh, like to learn from, from any um, outcome data that you can provide, that kind of thing. Is there any areas of patient care that are particularly challenging? Uh, in which case, probably other departments also struggle with that and would like to know any improvements that you can make in that as well. So anything that you can do to spread the learning, look at, um, look at the extremes in your department. And then your personal vision, you want to do something that you think is important to you, as Madhu was saying, if you've got a long term project that those kind of need to be the ones that you really feel are, are wildly important. Um, and if you can unite it with something beyond just CV points and, uh, and make it really relevant to you, I think that encourages your motivation. So if you can think, well, I want to actually get better at being an educator, uh, then do something with a teaching intervention. If you want to get better at stats, do something with a bit of stats in it. Obviously, start small at first if that's your aim. Um, but those sorts of things, I think, uh, really help if you want to do something that will help your presenting skills. Look at a project that's likely to get you a few oral presentations at a few conferences. So I think if you unite those things, then you're on the right path to generating ideas. But the next step is key. Once you've got that idea, don't just jump in. I think this has been a problem for me uh, and is a problem for a lot of people that when you come up with an idea, you get excited about it and you just want to go and do it. But I think if you do two things first, uh, then you can save yourself a lot of time. So the first one here is assessing the feasibility. Uh, and this everyone knows is looking at the SMART um, mnemonic. So is your project specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound? Try and do this overtly on a piece of paper. It doesn't take very long. 
Uh, it takes about 10 minutes to write those things down. And then I add on the end a why. Why would it not be completed? Uh, so how surprised would you be if your project either doesn't get completed or go to plan on a scale of one to 10? What would be the reasons for that? Is there anything that you could do to guard against that? Any people that you could involve that would be very helpful, a particular supervisor, a particular colleague who's got certain abilities like statistical um, uh, analysis um, or access to certain types of data? Um, and then are there any immediate actions that you could take to mitigate those risks? So involving those people, um, looking at uh, accessing other resources, these kind of things I think can be really helpful. So if you write those things down on a piece of paper, um, just to get an idea, I think that's a big help. And something you can do simultaneously with any project is looking at uh, the end goal. So reverse engineer it. What are you targeting in terms of congresses and or journals that you might like to publish in? Because um, that's going to change how you might uh, how you might design your project um, and therefore how you might write it up afterwards. So you want to know what are your outcomes of interest, your variables, how easy is it to access the data? Sometimes that's actually a big stumbling point, um, particularly in this world where not all software is joined up. If you're sharing the work with others, um, how are you going to split that fairly? Uh, and what's your rough timeline? It doesn't need to be dead accurate. It just needs to be something that you've got down on paper as a preliminary idea. And only once you've done those two things, uh, assessing the feasibility and reverse engineering, would I then make a final decision as to whether I'm going to go ahead with the project. Looking back, I would have saved so much time on a good few projects if I'd done this in advance. Safety in numbers, uh, well, certainly for the, for the bigger projects, that's, uh, that's necessary. As Dr. Little was suggesting, if you want to do anything multi-site, obviously that's got to be collaborative and involving many people. But for the smaller projects, should you go alone or, or work in a team, going alone will almost always take more time. You'll need a supervisor either way. Uh, you'll need someone that you can trust. But what characteristic of theirs do you need to trust? You need to trust uh, in you know the prestige of their name, knowing that your work is going to get more visibility because it's got your supervisor's name on it. Um, do you want to make sure there's someone very reliable, uh, that they're always contactable? Um, do they need to be good at coming up with ideas um, for related projects, these kind of things? And if you're working with colleagues, either registrars, allied health professionals, uh, other students, then I think there's three main things to look at. You want to make sure they're working in their area of competence. Um, I once worked with a very good uh, specialist nurse um, on a project, and she does a lot of data collection um, for us. Um, and that was looking at radiology reports, uh, recording the findings. And unfortunately, that wasn't something she was normally doing. Um, and we didn't specifically educate her on how to do that. So when we came to look at the results, actually, they weren't reliable. Um, so, so that was a big problem in that respect. So make sure that the people you're working with are working in their area of competency, that they'll do it reliably, and that they'll communicate uh, effectively regarding any delays and coordinating uh, different parts of the project. Predictable curveballs. Once you become known as, as someone who does does a few projects um, and is quite keen, then you'll often get asked uh, just out of the blue in the corridor, or would you be interested in doing this in this project? Um, and I think a lot of us want to be helpful and say yes, uh, but you've got to remember if you say yes to that, you're going to say no to other things, either other projects that might have interest you, uh, either learning opportunities in your normal, normal working day when you're going to be working on this project now, uh, or you'll be giving up some of your free time outside of work because you'll be working on this. Um, so a useful phrase, if you're not confident enough to say, actually, no, what you're suggesting isn't quite aligned with my interests, um, uh, so I'm going to say no. If you're not confident enough to say that, uh, I would recommend just saying, um, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. And that normally gives you the space then to come back confidently and say, no, I, I won't take this on. Thank you. Um, things that have come up in projects I've done where I've not planned ahead are things like, oh, can we actually just get data for a few more patients? I know we said we were going to do 100, but let's do 200. Um, that's really annoying. Can we record additional variables actually for each of those patients? That always takes a lot of time, uh, is another real nuisance um, and something that can be defeated with planning ahead. Uh, something I touched on earlier, if you have a long project, you want to make sure it's one that you're really motivated for. And you might find if that's not the case, you are very keen in the, in the beginning, but then with time you lose interest. Um, so I think if you can align it with something, making sure it's something, a part of patient care you're really interested in, um, a specialty you're really interested in, and it's going to get you um, 
uh, also help you to upskill in certain areas. I think that's uh, going to help you stick with it. Uh, looking ahead at who's doing the stats, that's always important. It's often a rate limiting step for any, uh, any of the larger studies uh, and can be difficult to find people to do that. Um, and certainly if, I, if there are any people watching this who are not already in radiology training or early in the radiology training, I would suggest trying to learn to do a bit of stats is actually really helpful because once you're someone who can do that, uh, you can actually have the pick of a lot of projects that you get involved with um, and you'll be, become a go-to person. It can be a double-edged sword. Um, and lastly, make sure that you are not up late at night writing things last minute for last minute posts or abstract or presentation deadlines because that's just not a nice place to be and that's another reason to look ahead and see where you're uh, where you're planning to present and when that's going to be and also a reason to know how th how long things take you you know how long did it take me to do this presentation it's 15 minutes it took me probably three hours reflecting writing editing um, and then another hour over the week just rehearsing it so know know how long things take you um, that's that's a big part of it and like Madhu's also suggested trying to do a little bit and often is much better than uh, trying to uh, cram it all in at the last minute and much more pleasant uh, and I think that takes a lot of planning so in conclusion just be as proactive as you can arm yourself with your own ideas uh, and that is a big step towards getting towards a project. It might not be a firm idea, but it gives other potential supervisors a substrate to work with. Plan as much as you can. Um, so assess the feasibility, reverse engineer. If you're asked about a project and you're not sure that you want to do it, say, I'll think about it, I'll get back to you. Um, try and align your projects with what you want to do. Uh, and I think, I think that should be very useful. All right. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, and I, if you have any questions for Madhu or I, then feel free to ask. Thanks, Madhu and Tom, for that great overview and um, great slide with the curveballs. I think I've definitely been smacked in the face by several of those in the past. Um, any questions or from the audience for speakers? Um, I've got one question for Tom. Thanks, Madhu and Tom. That was brilliant. Uh, uh, and uh, as Tim said, uh, uh, Jim said, those curveballs are yeah definitely there and you definitely get hit by them so uh, and you and I both have done so uh, yeah. I was just going to say um, I was interested to hear that Madhu said you know it's great to have protected time in an academic post but obviously for the vast majority of, of trainees not in an academic post yourself included where do you find the time in your week to start you know dedicate to these projects how much time in a week or a fortnight do you think is appropriate to be spending on them and how much do you go over your you know you know working weekends etc mm. yeah i think in the past um i really struggled with that with that in the beginning and i would do most of the work outside of my normal working hours to be honest with you um with time though i would try and do a little bit during the on calls uh, but that's a bit chaotic you don't always have guaranteed time you might your on calls might be so busy you can't you know do do some of the work uh, often night shifts were a good time but not always a guarantee so i think if you've got um a working week that is reasonably predictable you know you've got a placement say in, in well in either diagnostic or interventional radiology so long as you've got a bit of time in your week that you can look ahead and just block out an hour or, or two hours you know you should have sba time now and that's a big advantage for people and you need to make sure that you get that and that you use it um so i think making sure that those times are blocked out um and that in that time either you are uh, minimally contactable or you're just out of the department um because otherwise you will get pulled back in um i don't know if maddie if you have any uh thing else to add on that uh, from your acf experience if that's shown you anything new um, I think one of the biggest pitfalls for me during my ACS was I would save up all of my kind of research jobs that piled up for that one ACS day in the week. And if it didn't get done on that day, we'd have to wait the next week. And now that I'm SP4 and my ACF time has ended, I'm, I'm also kind of discovering slowly that the, the better you can kind of squeeze in small, small jobs during the day, the, the much better everything else goes. Because no one wants to spend their whole Saturday working on a project. Um, especially on top of phone calls and stuff. Um, I haven't tried your advice about trying to fit it in on a night shift, so I feel like I should try that out next time on a, I'm on nights. It's risky. You don't know how accurate you'll be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, no, I think I think small small chunks regularly and and kind of get it back to the person who needs to hear back from you as soon as possible, because um, otherwise they also will have you know such a long to do list that you just fall right to the bottom of that if, if they don't hear from you regularly. Um, so, so yeah, turning it around quickly, I think it's really important. I think I think that's really important. Really, I think what we need to like Prof Litter was saying, we need to change the culture if we do want to be doing more research and we're not all academic maybe it's worthwhile for everybody to say, I've got X number of projects to do. I need this allotted time in my SPA to do it with your clinical supervisors, negotiating that ahead of time so you're not disappointing people on the wards or in the lab. Um, might be useful going forward for everyone. Yeah, and I think um, you wanna make sure so that you're not overloaded with projects. Sometimes you, you get quite a lot of people asking you and you, say, you end up saying yes to too much. Um, but I think with time, you might learn what your optimal number of projects is to have on at any one time. Um, so I'd say sort of between one to three. Uh, sometimes zero is also nice. But um, if you can have a quota, then when people come to you and say, oh, could you do this? And you say, actually, I've already got I'm already at my quota of working at three. And that's kind of why I can work maximally sustainably um, and do a good job for, for you as well and get back to you in a timely fashion. So I think a quota can be a good way of setting a limit. We've got a comment in the chat um, from Michael. Amazing slides and graphics. Thanks for the talk. My advice to junior colleagues is always to focus on transferable research skills particularly in data wrangling and data analysis. Small or bigger projects can all contribute to this development of skills. Any comments from the panel? Yeah, well, I, first of all, oh, sorry, I was just going to say big, big thank you to Tom, who's been in charge of all of the amazing graphics and slides. Um, so I think, I think you're absolutely right, Michael, um, in that all of these skills are transferable. The, the most kind of helpful thing I think I've ever done um, is to, to do a course in stats and um, it, it just means like exactly like Tom said things come your way where someone's like I've already got all of this data that's been collected can you help and that's such a lovely place to come into a project because you get a, a lot of benefit going forward from that but a not, a lot, not a lot of the kind of um, very onerous data collection side of things. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it is all about the transferable skills. And once you've written kind of, you know, one paper and one poster and done some stats, you've kind of got a lot of the skills in your, in your arsenal already that, that you can use next time and time and again. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Uh, I think the being the stats person is a very useful position. The only thing is that if, uh, if someone's coming to you halfway through a project, then sometimes they might not have everything, all the variables that you would want. You might want to try and make sure that any projects you do take on, you're, you're uh, in from the start. Uh, or if you're not, that you're doing it with someone you trust and that uh, you know, you're going to have a decent data set to work with. But I think definitely uh, encouraging people to be able to do data analytics um, and, and have statistical uh, analytical abilities is, is paramount, actually. And I think that's only going to be more key. And it's also important when looking and reading research papers um, and having an understanding and insight of uh, whether they're using the appropriate uh, statistical um, analyses um, and, and the flaws and the pitfalls, because mostly people will just read the words, but you know you won't have a, an understanding of uh, what, the, what the flaw is to the p-value, that kind of thing. I've got one, one last question. I think time for one more. Um, Annie's asked, did you find it difficult keeping your IR skills up during your research time? Any tips on how to keep on top of them? Um, so I, I did my ACF with SD1 to 3, and I've just started my IR fellowship now in SD4. So I've not really had that experience, but from kind of diagnostic radiology, then yes, it is, it is tricky balancing both, um, particularly when it comes to exams. Um, but I think with diagnostic radiology, you have a bit more flexibility in being able to kind of catch up. You can you can do a bit of your kind of allocation reporting out of hours, or you can do some extra reading, et cetera. And all of that can keep you up to speed. I think with IR, you don't really have that luxury. So I, I can imagine that it, it, it's trickier taking time out. Perhaps I guess Tom, I... You, you've got, oh, sorry. Yeah, Tom, any thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think if you've got that allocated uh, research time, that's definitely a benefit. In IR, I think as a trainee, you're usually doing sort of seven or eight sessions of IR a week. Um, again, you should still have SPA time. And I think you need to make sure that ahead of time you carve out you know, uh, an afternoon each week that you should be doing SPA or uh, a couple of hours. And in that time, you don't necessarily need to be in the department. I think it's really important to plan ahead, block things off, do some proper deep work in that time. Um, that's, that's what I would say. And just try and get away from the department to do that. Brilliant. Thank you very much again for the questions. And thank you, Maddie and Tom, for giving up the time for giving us great insight into your research and training. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to join us a bit later on if you have time. So we're going to transition on to